Okay, uh, well, first off, the projector is not on. Only. If I push the button, it says on, it might turn it on, right? So, sorry for dragging everybody away from the big birthday free <laughs> lunch there. Hopefully you had the chance to get something to eat before you snuck up here to class. I don't know. Yeah, I was kind of surprised as I walked to class, they were still giving speeches that they're, so. Yeah, I saw the email, I think, was it Friday or Saturday they sent out the announcement for this? It was sometime just before the weekend. They didn't give us a lot of time to prepare and change our lecture schedule, but I kind of took the attitude, right, wrong, or indifferent, that uh, is it cool on? that classes are more important than, okay, that there. Uh, let me get my pen. I don't know if I can write. with this. And I don't want the notes to show up. Display setting. Oh, okay. I guess the notes only show up on mine and not yours. <laughs> that there. Okay. It's a little bit different. All right. And does this work? Seems to work. Okay. All right. This was the last slide I went to, and where we were going to next was we were going to start talking a little bit about sensors. There's, I'm going to get through these slides today because I want to start the lab on Thursday. I've got a favor to ask. Can someone come by the office Thursday about five minutes before class and grab the robot arm and carry it? That very, because to be honest with you, I'm not sure if I trust myself carrying that robot arm back there. You know, I, today I forgot my cane at home, so I'm going by, and I don't need the cane that much anyway. I mean, my walking's improved a lot. Okay, sensors. You know, as humans, we have five senses, they say, that there, and I kind of mentioned the fact that there are some research showing that we have some additional senses that don't show up in terms of um, you know, normal think, you know, thinking of senses, you know, kind of the sense that someone's behind you, even though you don't see them, you can get, kind of feel their presence. Anybody has that? You know, mothers always seem to have eyes in the back of their head. Yeah. <laughs> that they're, you know, they can sense that they're, and some of these senses are real, I suspect. Some are the fact that we can sense things with our normal perception that aren't, you know, that we don't realize we're sensing. But they're, one of the, one of the senses that has actually been proven to exist is the ability to tell direction. You know, I'm one of these people that you drop me in a strange city, I can usually find my hotel and I find my way around. My wife, on the other hand, gets lost going to the kitchen. That there, I mean, not to pick on my wife, if she ever hears me say that, she'll probably yell at me, but that's the truth is, is that there, I remember we were in Cebu one time and we were asked, we stopped and asked for directions to the hotel. I knew it was not far from where we were at. And the traffic or the tourist policeman said it's 300 meters there and turn left and your, there's your hotel. And my wife's asking if we could take a taxi, you know, that there, because she just could not fathom that 300 meters was the distance between here and the guard shack, essentially, that there. I mean, so, but regardless, robotic sensors have to be able to sense various things that there. And I kind of mentioned some some of the others that there, 
tiny bits of invisible radiation. I mentioned the canary bird in the coal mines, the, the, you know, the smell for methane gas, that their carbon monoxide. That they're, I, I think I mentioned the alcohol sensor that I've worked on in the past. But there's many, many different types of sensors that there. So this is, for example, a camera on the end of a robotic arm. Now this particular robotic arm just shows the camera. Normally what you would see is something more like this drawing right here, where here's an actuator to pick something up or to do something, and the sensor is off to the side. At there. Normally the sensor is not right at the end of the actuator or the arm, but it's nearby. So, so we have a number of these. This, might, for example, might be a sensor to get in there and this looks like a hard drive mechanism down there in a box and it might be to screw the screws in or something like that. I don't know what this is. I mean, this is a, somebody's drawing at there, but regardless, the whole idea is sensor can work pieces that randomly pile by using 3D sensors. The idea of using a 3D sensor is that 3D, 3D means that you can measure distance relative right there. I mean, as humans, we sense 3D because we have two eyes and we have stereophonic vision. That way, I have a fairly good idea that you're closer than he is. That there. Without stereophonic vision, we would not, and when I use the word stereophonic, it means two eyes. I mean, stereo is a word for stereo music, which means two speakers, quadraphonic. But they're humans, we, we've gotten by with stereo vision right there, and that's what we, the normal. Uh, one of the things that sometimes happens to those of us that wear glasses, that sometimes we lose our depth perception a little bit with glasses. I, although I'm too lazy, and I will use the word MOAS with a big capital M to put contacts in and out every day. That's why I, tend, I wear glasses out there. Besides, I have to carry glasses anyway for the reading glasses. So if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna use glasses, I might as well just use glasses out there. But um, one thing I did no, do notice that when I wear contacts, my depth perception is better out there. And, and I'm not the only one to have noticed that. Now, most people don't have quite as uh, there, but it's one of those issues. To, so alignment. So again, he, here they're kind of showing the fact. Other sensors, this is a force sensor to, to tell how, you know, how much force is on something. Now, force is a relative term, you know, another, way of looking at it up there is you can measure how much weight a particular object is. One of the, even though it's not robotic, uh, in the U.S. they have these uh, checkout counters where you check out yourself right there. And they're quite elaborate actually up there. And you know, you've got a little place where you can hang the bag to put your groceries in after you scan. And you scan an item and you put it in the bag. You scan an item and put, put it in the bag. And the systems are actually programmed to measure the weight of what's in the bag. And the relative weight of pretty much every SK, SKU or every item in the store is stored. So, so when I scan an item and I put it in the bag, the computer does a check to make sure it's the right item that there because it knows that this box of cornflakes weighs roughly 450 you know, grams or something like that. So if I scan a box of cornflakes and I drop in an iPad, you know, it notices that. <laughs> that there it notices you know the difference that there. So and you know and you know, and the idea is that a checkout counter without a person monitoring each item you check in and putting it into the bag looks like an invitation for theft. Isn't that there? I mean, it's a pretty, you know, and believe me, thieves have tried multiple times. And as soon as the wrong weight shows up in the bag, an alarm goes off and 
somebody is there right away looking at the bag and looking what you know looking at the computer and seeing what's scanned and you don't get away with too much <laughs> out there you know actually the the alarm goes off quite frequently because a lot of times you know you'll scan an item and you've been to the register and it doesn't pick up the scan and I'm in a hurry and I'm scanning an item, throwing it in the bag, scanning an item. I scan an item, it, it misreads it, I throw it in the bag anyway, and then all of a sudden the alarm goes off <laughs> out there. But regardless, you know, that's an example of, it's not necessarily robotic, but it's an example of you know, a force sensor that's used in an automated system. And going back to my beginning, I consider anything that's automated part of the robotic area. You know, this course is automation and robotics. So self-checkout, you know, reg cash registers falls under that, that category of automation. You're replacing a worker. You know, the worker is the cashier. And you will go in the U.S. and the U.K. and you will probably find in a large Big, we call them big box stores, that there are a large you know, store such as a uh, Tesco. Tesco's closest thing to a, to a Myers or Walmart or the typical big box store in the U.S. and the U.K. Tesco is actually, is that, I think, a French company? U.K.? Okay, Carrefour was French. Okay, so Tesco is a French company. Uh, what, let's see, there's another one up there, uh, Aldi, I think Aldi's German or, or something like that. Yeah, they don't have Aldi here. But regardless, you could go to a Tesco-type store in the U.S., we don't have Tesco's, that there, and you'll see 20 cash registers like you see at, at Eon Big. But you only find four of them with, ca with cashiers working at them. All the rest of them have no no people there. And it doesn't have a person there working, you know, ca cash registry. You walk up to the cash register and you do your own scanning, your own bagging, and everything else. And there might be one person for every four to six registers. The, the, you have to supervise and just kind of keep an eye. So 75% of the cash registers are not at there. So, but you get it out of the store quickly because there's 20 cash registers there, but there's only five people working the 20 cash registers out there. So as a result, they save the salary of 15 workers. And that's the whole idea of automation. And that's one job I've never had. I've had friends of mine that worked as cash register, or cashiers at stores and that at their I don't know if I could find that board that you know moving the magnet core from one assembly line from one car to an assembly line was pretty boring. But uh, at least as a cashier, you get to uh, talk to people and see people. But still, it's not exactly what I call very intellectually challenging work out there. So, but again, that there the example that they give is. I actually have a new pin coming later this week. I, in the process of trying to get my computer to, okay, right here. Here, here they have a source source sensor that they're and they're inserting something into it to an item right here, and they're inserting it with a precise amount of force. You know, other force sensors will work in the area of you're trying to screw bolts on. And sorry ladies, but this example is more for the guys, but if you ever put the head on a uh, on a on an engine and that there and uh, yeah I'm not gonna try drawing. Let me just do it here. But here's the here's the top of the engine right there. And if you're looking at it sideways, there's your four cylinder holes right there. 
And then on the top, there's something called the head right there. It has to be bolted onto that there, and there's a gasket called the head gasket. And that's what holds the cylinders in, you know, that there. And the top of the head is where the explosion kicks off in order to that there. Well, a head on, on an engine has to be bolted in a particular pattern and a particular torque or amount of pressure on each bolt. Otherwise, the head warps and you end up with leakage around the head gasket and your car gets very poor, poor performance. And if you have a warped head, you're usually looking at at least removing the head and putting a new one on or replacing the head gasket. It's a very expensive activity right there. So you don't want, usually the spark plugs screw into the head, for example, as well. Right there. So the, the head is a very complex part of the engine right there. And it has to be placed on the engine with pretty good precision in terms of each bolt has to be tightened in a certain order at a certain torque and then we'll go back and retighten that there. If you don't put the head on properly in the right order with the right torque, you warp it that there. And since most engines are now assembled by robotics, there's torque sensors in every, you know, every actuator that tightens these bolts. Same thing with the, with the wheels on your car, yeah, that there. If you don't tighten them tight enough, your wheel falls off. That's not a good thing going down the, you know, the north-south highway at 130 kilometers an hour, all those speed limits 110, that there are even 150 or 60, some, which some folks drive, having your wheel fall off is not necessarily a good thing. If you tighten them too tight, then you can risk breaking the lug or warping the, uh, disc right there. Actually, it's a little panel that behind the disc. The disc goes in front, but you have to make sure that they're within a particular range. Now, if you go to a, to a garage that uses the pneumatic, they actually have a little slip gear that actually goes up to that torque and then stock slips out that there. But, it, but in terms, terms of factories, they, they do various other things right there. So, Oh, I already skipped to the previous slide right there. Okay, the next slide right here is measuring distance right there. And here what we have is an infrared ranging meter. It sends an infrared signal out. It has a reflector in which it reflects back. That's what this is showing us, the reflector right there. Or is that a quarter to show size? I'm not sure. Usually they have, they're looking for a reflector. Oh, actually this is a ranging, so it doesn't have a reflector. The reflector is the object that you're measuring the distance to, right there. You know, this is two different technologies to measure distance. Ultra rain, ultrasonic sends a sound wave and waits for the, that there. Infrared sends a, a infrared light signal there and, and again measures, you know, the time that there. Ultrasonic is, the normal way that they use for measuring distance, you know, ultrasonics and the sound. Infrared is used more for a proximity type. That there. You know, in my garage back in, in the U.S., you know, there's a garage door that came down, and on each side there was a little sensor right here. One would send a light to here, and it would sense whether or not there's some object in the doorway. And the idea of this here is to check to see whether or not your child happens to crawl through under the garage door. And if he does, you stop the garage door from going down and you reopen it, thus saving the life of your child, right? That there. So it's one of those cases that there. These are not perfect because I uh, one time um, forgot to... Uh, you know, I started to shut the garage door and my van wasn't completely out of the garage door. Unfortunately, the tires were out, but the, the bulk of the van was still in. And I managed to take a rear window and smash it into about a million pieces out there. 
So, you know, so that's a particular sensor. These are used a lot with on elevators, you know, that they're as a safety mechanism. I noticed that they're they malfunction a lot while I'm here in Malaysia, and you can't rely on them because I'm used to if someone's trying to get in the elevator and say hitting the open door, I just wave my arm in front of the what's well, supposed to be the sensor. Well, that doesn't always work. <laughs> or I go and I take my hand and I press against the the, the uh, floor sensor up there. Now these are two sensors that are supposed to sense for safety purposes. More than once I discovered that neither neither of those sensors worked and the elevator door is going to shut anyway, which makes me kind of scared because if a child starts to come in or go out and the elevators, you know, safety sensors are not working, then people get hurt. And I've read enough stories of that happening up there. So it's a, up there. This is particular ultrasonic is to explore. These are used a lot, you know, Ultrasonic and infrared are used a lot in the like robotic vehicles and things like that in terms of measuring distance. That, that there, you'll see them a lot on the self-driving cars. That, that there, they actually sell an ultrasonic uh, ranger for people who play golf. To, they you know they point it toward the green and tell some distance between you know where they're driving from in the green in order to know which, which iron to use or which wood to use. I'm not that big, that, that good of a golfer, so I never bother with such things, but I have golfing friends that do that. Ultrasonic sensors are used in fish finders, that there. You know, that's, you, you, there's, you put something on the bottom of the boat or you stick it in the boat, and it looks for moving objects under the boat. That there, it sounds, and sound beams that looks for fish swimming out there in, in order to help you catch more fish. I grew up in Minnesota where we have, you know, our state model is, I, and they don't have state models here, I don't know. They're, they're, you know, they're, you know, like Wisconsin's the dairy state. Uh, uh, Minnesota was the land of 10,000 lakes. Yeah, out there. We had a lot of fresh water lakes. Actually, 10,000 to lie, it was more like 14,000. We had a lot of lakes out there. And they were fresh water lakes with a lot of fish. So people like to fish a lot out there. And I don't necessarily fish much anymore. <laughs> there. I'm not a fish, fisherman. But, you know, but I remember even as a kid, when the ultrasonic fish sensors came out, people were buying them. To, these are odds. Uh, there's a lot of fish here, let's drop our line here. Uh, there's no fish, let's go elsewhere in the lake type of thing. That there. And my least favorite activity I should point out is ice fishing. Oh, man. You go out in the middle of the lake, you drill a little hole in the ice, you drop a little fishing pole there, and you sit for hours waiting for fish. That there. It's, I can't think of a better way to a worse way to spend, spend a Sunday afternoon. Now, in Minnesota, people used to bring little black and white TVs that, that were battery operated and watch football games while they were out fishing. And a case of uh, adult beverages, I'll let you figure out what I mean by that and sit out that there. But it was never my idea of fun that there. So, but ultrasonic sensing out there. And there will be a, a review before the final exam of all the different types of sensors. So I'm just going to give some examples here. This is a tilt sensor. What it basically has in it is mercury, which is a liquid metal. And mercury will, will move as you tilt something. And there's two electrodes in there. And as the mercury moves from one end or the other, it opens or closes the switch, so it tells whether it's tilted. There's actually more accurate versions of these right here. Tilt sensors are actually used a lot in old-style thermostats. Yeah, you know, in order to turn the heating or air conditioning on, what they used to use was a spring like this right here, and then a mercury tube at the top right here. <coughs> and what... <clears throat> on the on this coil 
would be two different metals that would expand and contract at different rates with temperature. So as the temperature would go up, for example, this, this tilt sensor would go this way or this way as the temperature moved. If it's the exact same temperature, and you would uh, turn the thermostat to, to the setting to where it would be flat. Now I'm speaking, well, let's say you want a room to be 23 degrees, so you would set it to 23. If it got warmer than 23, then it would start to tilt, and the switch would then close and turn on the air conditioner right there. So these were early version, early thermostats. And they were actually cheaper back in the 1970s, 60s, even into the early 80s than putting thermal sensors in and measure electronically and use a microprocessor. Because you, you know, this is back before automated controls, you know, microcontrollers and digital controls. And you only, your control was an on off switch. <coughs> so they would use some version of a tilt sensor to sense the temperature. There. What you're measuring is temperature that there, and you're either telling whether it's below or above a certain threshold, and you use the physical property of metal expanding, contracting that there in a coil, and depending on what the temperature is, the coil will kind of turn this way or turn this way because, because of the two different materials, and that was very common. Out there, I haven't seen that type in many years. Out there, I mean, you know, I, you know, I'm kind of giving you ancient history, but you know, some sensors that you'll come across may be a, using a physical property you don't think about measuring temperature. You don't think about the fact that a piece of metal will straighten or bend depending on the temperature, right there. So, and instead of putting a strain gauge, which produces a voltage. That's that there. So here's they're using an example. They place this is a tilt sensor. It has on here. They don't. It's kind of hard to see the little, you know, the little mercury tube there, and it measures whether or not there's a tilt. There's probably better ways to measure tilt today than using a mercury tube. But and and mercury, by the way, is avoided a great deal because they very poisonous out there. Very poisonous out there. So we'll come back to sensors. This is kind of a warm up that just kind of that there. We're still kind of in in the introductory section looking at. There. Now we get into actuators. The most common are the electrical. Right there, actuators are can be motors of some type or another. Here we're talking. A synchronous motor oh, is a motor that will turn at a single speed function that's a function of the frequency of which is driving up there. So synchronous motors will will turn according, you know, you know they're synchronized with the line voltage. You know, that's why they call it synchronous. And that sometimes gets you in trouble. For example, I've brought over from the U.S. a refrigerator and freezer from the United States and I run it through a step-down transformer right there. And I have to realize that this, those motors are, are turning about 20% about slower than they would in the U.S. Because in the U.S. we use 60 hertz, Malaysia uses 50 hertz up there. So I may affect the life of the, of the of the motor somewhat out there. You know, same thing with my, you know, my wife brought over her KitchenAid mixer and food processor. I mean, we had all this stuff in the U.S. And, you know, why, why throw it away and buy new when we get here where we can buy a transformer and reuse it. But some of the speeds are a little bit different out there. Now with the, with the, with the food processor and the mixer, it's no problem because you can adjust the speed. But the refrigerator, you know, the motor's running a little bit slower. It doesn't really matter that much in terms of refrigerator freezer motors. I've, you know, I've brought a refrigerator from the UK back to the US when I was in the Air Force and it ran fine for another 10 years before it gave me trouble. 
my refrigerator and knock on wood, and this is not wood, but it's got some kind of wood product in it. That's kind of a, you know, lucky charm thing that they're, it's been operating for about three years without any trouble. Out there. I mean, you know, most people I know that have brought appliances from the U.S. have not had problems with them working here. And a lot of students that study and get their PhDs in the U.S. have brought things back in for Canada. The stepper motor is one that will turn a particular precise number of degrees given a electronic signal. They're used a lot in terms of positioning type robots right there. So again, that there, I used to have a satellite dish, you know, one of those big dishes in the sky that you would turn a particular set of you know, degrees to pick up a particular satellite to watch it. You know, each satellite that was on the band had 24 transponders that you could get channels for. So I could get 24 channels on this satellite, 24 channels on this satellite. Not all transponders were occupied or used out there, and there was a number of repeats. But, you know, I could get a couple hundred TV channels back in the days before cable TV was common, <coughs> and, you know, using the satellite, because satellites are what's used by the TV stations to get the signals up there. So, separate motors is another type of motor. AC servos, I have not used too many AC servos. That's there. So what do you mean by servo? Well, a servo motor, we'll look at it much more detail, but a servo motor has electronics on it to control the speed or direction of the motor. So we'll, we'll look at it, you know, Servo motors are what we're using for the, our robots right there. But it's got electronics on it in order to turn it that there, there's usually some feedback involved with the servo motor to keep it that they're not always. And the, you've got the brushless and the brush DC motors. Again, I'm not gonna go into the difference. DC motors are quite common in small robots. There's two types of servo motors in terms of DC. There's the continuous and the thick, or the standard servo. We'll look at both of those in detail, and we'll do a couple labs with those out there. So the servos, we're, we're going to be doing some labs with. The synchronous, your power electron, you know, your power courses, you've dealt with synchronous motors. Yeah, that the, the stepper motor, I wish I had a couple to play with, but I don't. They're fairly interesting. But we'll, again, we're going to get, this is kind of the overview. We'll get into these in more detail. But these are some of that they're also not mentioned is just the regular DC motor right there. And we'll be looking at some of those as well. That, that one's not mentioned. DC motors we usually control with pulse width modulation of some form or that there. So... Here we also have besides right well, here now he talks about the DC motor right there. That's that's a, probably the most common motor you'll find in many applications right there. Standard DC motor. This is a stepper motor right there. They're, they're shaped different. This is a servo motor, and we'll I've got some of those. We'll play with those. We'll write some, some labs. The the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi control those very easily. You know, we'll do a couple of demo labs using the Arduino. And that's actually what's in our robots right there. Then we have a pneumatic motor. A pneumatic motor is one in which we give it, we, we drive it with air right there. And I've worked in a number of industrial plants where they use pneumatic motors. Pneumatic motors are very, very common in industrial settings. Because one is they're safer. You don't have to have electricity going through that there. Uh, the most common, and every guy's seen a pneumatic motor, and even you ladies, you, you go to a uh, you go to a car, you know, a car, a tire dealer, and have them take your tires off, put new tire tires on. They use what calls an air wrench, right? Well, an air wrench is a is an, is a pneumatic motor that turns the wrench, right? So that's a type of pneumatic motor. And you'll find those also in a lot of industrial types. 
and you also have the pneumatic cylinder. The easiest form of a pneumatic cylinder is any kind of car jack that you that, that you pump at there. And it could be at a car dealer that has the big jack. That one's probably hydraulic. It's probably not pneumatic. But the little tire pump that you pump up, pump your car up with, that's a pneumatic cylinder. At the, here. At the door. Yeah, the open and closed doors. Yeah, that there. Again, there's many, many types of pneumatic cylinders out there. They're, they're very, fairly common use. And then there's the pneumatic dampener, which is what they have to keep the door from closing very quickly out there. So then you have the hydraulic. The hydraulic uses oil. And hydraulic motors and hydraulic lifts are typically for large loads out there. If I want to lift a four, a, a two, 2,000 kg car, I'm not going to do it with air. I'm going to blow those cell, those those uh, gaskets right out. I'm going to need one heck of an air pump. I'm probably going to use a hydraulic fluid in order to in order to pump out. That's an hydraulic cylinder. There are a lot of hydraulic motors for moving assembly lines. The problem with hydraulic is that you have to be careful because leaks end up being very messy. It can be very dangerous too. You know, hydraulic fluid also can get quite hot as it's under pressure and it can burn and can blind someone or, or kill them if you have if you spring a spring a leak. So hydraulics are used in a lot of industrial settings. Obviously we're not gonna use anything with hydraulics because I'm not gonna deal with the safety issues of hydraulics. That, that's it. But these are different types of actuators. And remember actuators, their job is to move something or to do something. Now there are other types of actuators that are not mentioned here in terms of, you know, an actuator might very well be the light control of a, of a room. And again, you're, you're, that they're, you're causing a physical property that change the, the amount of light. Another actuator might be something like a loudspeaker system or a siren. You know, these are, now a siren is actually a motor that actually that creates noise out there, but uh, there are there are uh, speaker-driven sirens out today. But again, these are different types of movements. So we've covered examples of two of the main parts of our robotic system: sensors and actuators. And then we're going to the next level, which is the controller. So these slides are kind of going through the various subsystems in a robot or automated system right there. We have the sensors that tell, tells the robot or the automated system, whether it's a car, an assembly line or whatever, what's going on. It's the eyes, ears, nose of the robot right there. And they can be that thing. The actuator is what causes things to happen. It's the arms, it's the wrenches, it's the cylinders, it's what causes the movement right there. Or in cases, uh, you know, light or sound. The controller is what ties the two together. You know, I see a ball coming and I want to be able, and I'm the goalie of a football team and I want to block <coughs> it with my head that they're, well, the actuator is my legs to jump up and, you know, the muscles in my body to hit, hit the ball. You know, the sensor is my eyes when I see the ball coming toward the goal. Well, the controller is the brain of the goalie to tell the goalie when to jump and which direction to move their hands or, or head right there. So. Well, provide the necessary intelligence to control the manipulator slash mobile arm. The manipulator is the is the again the actuators right there. You know, it could be the arm, it could be the wrench of turns, it could be anything that, that we're trying to control right there. So, but well, you could have one controller control multiple manipulator. 
multiple parts of the robot. So in other words, if you have a six you know, degree of freedom robot, you know, like the one that we'll bring to the class, you know, someone will carry it to class on Thursday, there's six motors on that. We don't have a controller for all six. We have one controller that controls all six right there. So same thing if we've got, you know, for example, a robot that's going to look for a vehicle to come down and then stick a wheel stick a tire on it at there. One controller may control the assembly line that moves the assembly line, may also look for the car, may actually place the tire there, and then that particular item goes back in the same controller that puts the four bolts on there. So the controller can, one can, can, controller can control multiple uh, manipulators or, or Actuators can also control the the sensing. So, the idea of the of the controller is to process sensory information and compute the control commands for the actuators that take that there. So the the robot has two or the controller has two parts. Now I'm going to use my stroke experience to kind of re relate to that. My sensory information is disputed in my hand. One of the problems I've got is that you can take a needle and poke it, poke it into these two fingers and I don't feel it. My, my, sens my sensory information is missing from my hand. That's it. That part of my brain is just not working anymore. Therefore, for me to count money is very difficult. That there. I have to see it with my eyes. That there. So a lot of things that you can do by feel, I can't do for feel right now. Cause that thing. So the actuators, like send the control. Part, you know, one of the problems I had is I had to retrain my legs to walk because that particular function was missing right there. So again, when we look at the human body, that we, we, we control the, you know, the actuators are the, are our legs, our, our ankle, our toes, you know, those are what helps us to walk. And our brain sends the necessary commands to the muscles to open and close them. And, and muscles are like an actuator. I mean, they're like motors. You, you know, what a muscle does is it contracts and expands. When you release it, it expands. When you contract it, it up there. So when I take my arm and I do this, um, shortening the bicep muscle. Not that I have, I'm not showing all the bicep muscle. If I want to put this way, I'm shortening the tricep muscle. They work in pairs right there. So a lot of times when we deal with a robot, we have to have a motor that moves the arm this way. We move it this way. Now motors don't have to have, don't have to have complementary motors. You know, one motor can go both directions. As it turns out, the human body is somewhat unique, is that <clears throat> muscles can only be actuated in one direction, and then they can be released. So I can, I can shorten a muscle, but I can't expand it right there. The way that I expand it is I contract the muscle behind it on a complementary muscle. So a lot of the biological-based robots are using similar systems now. But most robotic arms are controlled by a single motor that will move up or down, where the human body operates with complementary muscles, right there, complementary. But the controller is the brains. It what it's what at there. And controllers can be very complex. That can be very simple, right there. Storage that device there. You have to have a control program. And you have to know the state of the robotic system from the sensors. In other words, you have to know what, what where the motors are and what's going on out there. Now, this particular slide is very old. This happens to be a stamp microcontroller. This is a little stamp microcontroller. It's got some built-in memory. This is probably era 1980-something. <laughs> like I said, it's fairly old. These right here are actually motor controllers up there. Those are 
you know, MOSFET right there. They're not showing the A to D's coming into this. So this is a a very small. This actually is the same type of controller on a stab module right there. This is using an atom processor right there. A little bit more complex. Uh, a lot of the robotics are using ARM processors. One of the very common ones being used for, for small projects is the Arduino or Raspberry Pi, the ARM processors. I've seen robots that are controlled by 8286s, 8486s. I haven't seen any with i5 or i7s yet, but I'm sure they exist. It depends on how complex your robot is, is to how large the computational engine or the computer or the microprocessor is that controls it. One of the things to keep in mind is that processing power has gotten so much smaller and so much cheaper that we can develop robots that are much more robust or much more powerful and fit them into much smaller spaces than these slides tend to show. You know, I showed that video, or I put the video up for you to watch. I was going to show it in class and talk about it, but we ended up not being able to do that. But uh, when we look at uh, some of the humanoid type robots, they've got extremely high numbers of sensors going into them, <coughs> thousands of sensors going into the robot process. They've got 200, 300 degrees of freedom, which are various different actuators and motors in that there. Even if you look at something simple, and this was done back in the 1980s, I don't have a video of it, I probably should. Some of the early, you know, Disney did a uh, take your display where they had Abraham Lincoln get up and give a speech as a robot. But there, it's fairly impressive looking. And the gestures in his face and his arms, he moved right there. And the synchronization of the voice, of your, the voice, you know, which was recorded and the mouth and the, that there. You know, that required, at that time, a computer about the size of this table. I mean, it, you know, the computing power. You know, now that can be done with your cell phone. So, when we look at controller hardware, we're talking microprocessor microcontrollers right there. And I know everyone's taking a course either for myself or from another faculty member on both of those right there. So you've looked at, you know, you've looked at the 8051s. Some of you might have looked a little bit. We talked about the ARM processors you know, last semester, you know, on the Raspberry Pi. But you look at some of these microcontrollers and, and you know, the computer chips. And these are the same things that go into your cell phones and your desktop computers and your laptops. And these are what's controlled, the digital world. And digital electronics is what made, has made robotics what it is today. So controller hardware, right there. These are interface. We have A to Ds. Here we're showing some op amps for amplifying analog signals right there. This is, again, interfacing it to the real world. And that goes back to microcontrollers and interfacing. And that's a big part of automation and robotics right there. It's, it's a step up. That's one of the reasons that program class I think is going to be dropped. Because a lot of that material is in the robotics class as well right there. Okay, we're wrapping up my slides. It says i got 20 slides, but the last 10 or slides I skipped right there. This is a short list of industries that use robotics right there. Uh, I will show some videos later in a later course on how agriculture uses robotics. They have a very interesting system and again I'll, I'm not going to show it today. I don't even know if I've got it with me. A automatic milking machine robot that will actually with a camera find the uh, you know, the you know the tits on the cow at there you know and I'm not saying that in dry at you know, there but the uh, you know the, you know the, the uh, udder on the udder it'll find the appropriate place it will clean the you know, clean the udder 
beforehand it will place on the on the udder automatic using optical sensors it will place the milking apparatus it will then the apparatus will then suck the milk from the cow y'all massage do the massage that there I don't know if anybody's ever seen milking my ham but you grab the udder and just pull right there you know the old you know the old milking girl sitting on the on the stool with the bucket that there so but that's all done by a machine anymore the cow just comes in at leisure that there eats and the machine does all the work there's no human intervention when it's finished milking the cow cow leaves so there's self-driving tractors that will have GPS and have the GPS data for the farmer's field knows where all the rivers and creeks and all the trees and everything's are it's got, it's got the sensors and the tractors will plow the field without a farmer being on that there and one of my many jobs was working at a chicken farm many many years ago when I was like 17 years old and I got the fun job of driving the tractor to spread the manure afterwards that there and believe me if there's not a crappier job in the world it's being a manure spreader that there you literally drove around spreading crap everywhere that there. but the, what you were doing is fertilizing the field with the chicken waste but regardless you know I would not have been unhappy if that job was replaced by an automatic system that would go through and spread the manure. Automo automotive, automotive industry is probably the leading industry in the world of automation. We'll talk a lot more about that. General Motors was a lead player in developing the PLC, which we'll spend some time toward the end. That there, but the automotive industry did not develop the the assembly line but Henry Ford sure used it to make cars that there actually the assembly Henry Ford didn't develop the assembly line that was Henry Ford said the, yeah Henry Ford and make cars that there the construction industry of course uses a lot of robotic systems today entertainment and yeah, you know I mentioned player piano the first job replaced human job replaced by a robot was the piano player in a smoke right there so healthcare is getting to be kind of an interesting thing and that's a growing area there's actually hospitals now not in malaysia i haven't seen heard of them in malaysia but i know in fort wayne indiana where i was at we had hospital rooms in icu that had multiple cameras in it and multiple test equipment that were all audit automated. And a doctor would sit <coughs> in an office at a remote site and monitor patients from all around the county. And there was nurses on site at these hospitals, but the doctor himself was not there. But he had cameras that could do exams. He had blood pressure cuffs that would take, automatically take the blood pressure. So you found a lot of the patient care or diagnostics being done by robots and of course the reason that is in the US is that you know the US has got a very bad problem in terms of health care costs that there and in particular nurses are very expensive and doctors are very expensive a nurse makes more money in the US than a college professor yeah, so so if you want to make a lot of money in the U.S. and go to school for two years and get a quick degree and make sixty thousand USD a year, you become a nurse. I have an ex-wife that's a nurse, you know, and she's a good nurse. Terrible ex, terrible wife. That's why she's an ex-wife, but she was she's a pretty good nurse from everything I can tell. I, I put her through nursing school, and she made twice as much money as I did the last year I was in the U.S. I mean, so as a result. There's a huge motivation in the healthcare industry to replace people. Right there. So surgery, a lot of surgeries are done by robots because they can get in there and be more precise and get into smaller spaces. Right there. Laboratories, of course, that they're law enforcement. We talked about the robotic, uh, you know, use of 
robots for search and rescue or going into places to do surveillance. So far, there aren't any robots that, that do street patrols, but drones are becoming very popular in the UK and various border sites for looking and monitoring that their manufacturing goes with automation. Military goes back with law enforcement. Mining, I haven't talked about, but mining robotics are that they're one of the things uh, the current president of the United States, uh, the, the orange buffoon <laughs> that there is claimed is he's going to bring coal mining jobs back. What the, uh, the orange man forgot is that 90% of the coal mining jobs didn't go away because people would stop buying coal, but because robots and automation has replaced the miner going down in the coal mine and digging the coal mine with a pick and shovel. Coal mining is a terrible job. Why would anybody even want that job to come back? That thing. It's like you know, mining tin by hand. How many of you want to grab a shovel and dig holes and look for tin with a, with a, with a shovel and a bucket? No, no, no. You just as soon let the, you know, the scoop shovels and the machines do that, right? That the, there's a lot of jobs that you don't want to have come back, and mining is one of them. Transportation, we've talked a lot about that. Utilities, you know, again, we've got, you know, if, if they want to say, for example, read my electric meter, you know, they drive around in a car and it picks up the, uh, the reading, you know, from the street, and they print out the bill and stick it in my mailbox. Someone doesn't have to come in, look at the meter, take the data back to an office, warehouses right there. I need to find a video of Amazon's warehouse management that they're quite impressive. That they're, what they can do, and again, I'm not going to go through this, but I'm actually 55 minutes into the slide presentation, so I'm pretty much wrapping up. Robots in space. I've got another video I want to show on that, but robots are a huge, huge player in space exploration. Right there. Hazardous environments. Again, here we're talking in Antarctica under the water. Antarctica is, of course, the South Pole. I don't want to get under there with a scuba diving set. I'd rather send a robot there. You know, MH370. A lot of the a lot of this uh, hunting for the for that has been done with robots underwater. Right there. Hasbot is again operating in you know possible gases right there. If you want to go and look for survivors in a building that's filled with natural gas that could explode at any time, you probably don't want to send the firemen in the fire suit. You rather medical robots again. They're looking here at Get microsurgery right there. So again, we're looking at, at their entertainment robots. The future robots, I've already showed that one video. That shows really the future robots. They're, you know, garbage collection. This is actually a reality most of the in most of the US. We have a truck, only it's driven by a truck, but the truck comes down my street, the truck driver stops. He controls a robotic arm that picks up my trash can, dumps it into the trash can, and places the trash can back. He never gets out of the truck. That's unlike the scene here in Malaysia where I watched the six Bangladeshis get off. You know, nothing against Bangladeshis or any other nationality, but the six, you know, they're, they're mostly immigrant, you know, or uh, foreign workers at their just. Most of you guys don't want the job of going, running up to somebody's house, grabbing the trash can and dumping it in the back of the truck, right? That follows with my manure spreading job. You, you know, you just don't want that job. But again, that job has been eliminated for the most part. Instead of having five guys in the back of the truck running back and collecting the trash plus the driver, you only have the driver. Again, are those jobs that you care about? You don't want them. That's why you bring in immigrants to do the jobs. Well, if you could eliminate the jobs and not bring in the immigrants, what does that do for you know society? It, you know, it, it improves the social that there. It improves the fact that you don't have 
your currency going overseas because most foreign workers send their money overseas up there and I guess it's about time to humanoids and I'm going to stop at this point right there so that's the introduction this is robotics at this particular at there so the rest of the slides are all so let me stop right there